Okay, I'm, I'm starting. Yes, yes, okay. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's start then. Um, thank you very much for being here this afternoon and at the end of the uh, uh, summit. We prepared to um, hear a lot of numbers in charts. So uh, this is number intensive talk. And uh, I suggest that if you want, you can go to uh, bit.ly slash open cloud dance uh, talk you and get a copy of the slides because there you have um, clickable links to all of the dashboards that I'm going to present. Because the, the most interesting thing about the talk is probably that you play yourself. Because most of the numbers that I'm going to show are um, found, can be found in, in dashboards. And you can go there and dig deeper and find out other numbers that could be of, of, of interest to you. Okay, um, this, said, this is the idea of what I'm going to try to tell you. There are a lot of slides. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to um, go through all of them, but well, they are there for your reference too if, if you want to have more details. So I'm, I'm starting with a bit of context about myself and, and the company where I work. Then I'm going to talk a bit about the methodology. Um, I'm going to um, talk about the projects that we are going to analyze. So this is about analyzing different projects in the cloud area. I would be talking in a moment about which of them, and compared with OpenStack, but not only with OpenStack. Um, then I would be uh, showing um, some specific comparisons. The aging charts could basically show about the expertise of people in the project and how people are entering and leaving the project. Uh, the geographical region, where I'm going to, to talk about time zones and some other staff. And the hourly patterns, which are quite interesting to understand, same characterization of the, of the developers and also how to measure uh, corporate diversity in, in, in the projects, not only on, on, uh, as a whole, but also in a specific parts of the project. Then I, I would be talking about, um, about companies in, in particular, and as a bonus track, I'm going to show you some proof of concept that we are developing right now with Kibana-based dashboards, which are very uh, interesting because you can drill down uh, to uh, any level of detail about the kind of, uh, of thing that I've been uh, shown. Well, and then, I would draw some, some conclusions. So a bit of context. Um, this talk was prepared by me and Danny. Uh, Danny is not here, but probably is coming in a while because he was in, in another meeting right now. Uh, both of us are co-founders of Bitergia. Bitergia is a small company doing analytics. Basically, the, uh, the, the kind of analytics that, do, that we do is to uh, solve development analytics. So we go to the software repositories, like Git, like Bazilla, like a Launchpad, like uh, a Grid, like a mailing list, like uh, Stack Overflow, like any kind of place where developers are either having a conversation or doing something, get that stuff into a database, and then query the database to get interesting numbers, trends, uh, etc. Uh, we produce dashboards, we produce reports, we provide consultancy, that kind of stuff. I'm also working in the university. I've been uh, researching in this area for more than 10 years, and a part of what the company is doing is, in fact, um, some results of our uh, research group. So in some sense, we are trying to, um, uh, to take to the industry some practices that are somewhat common in the academic community for a while. Well, let's go. This is about the quantitative state of, of the cloud. There are several previous editions of this talk. So the first one I deliberated in Oskin uh, two years ago. Uh, last one I deliberated in Oskin again this year. And uh, the idea has always been the same, going to the main cloud uh, systems, OpenStack, CloudStack, Eucalyptus, and OpenNebula, and uh, analyze them, not exactly in a comparative way, because they are very different, but just to precisely focus on how different they are. But also finding some common things that all of them have in, have in, in common. And then there's going to be this bonus track we are in the OpenStack Summit, so I'm going to focus like half of the talk on OpenStack, trying to explain to you something, some findings that we um, found on OpenStack development, and also uh, trying to explain to you how you can find it by yourself by looking at the, uh, this Kibana dashboards that we have uh, set up for this uh, talk. So um, some words about the methodology so that you really understand with it. With it. So uh, first of all, we run a transparency analysis on the project that we're going to analyze. Transparency means how transparent they are when you are trying to get the data about how to develop. So I consider that a company may develop open source software by developing everything inside the company so that they only release software. But all the information about how the software is released may be 
keen stay in the company, and you never know about it. So this is not what usually happens in open source software, but it happens. So the first thing is to go there and see whether this project, in addition to being open source software, is really an open development project. So they really provide information about how they develop. So that's the transparency analysis. So then we go to the tooling, and once we know where the repositories are, we extract information of them. So for that, we use Metrics Grimoire. Metrics Grimoire is a tool of, uh, sorry, a set of um, um, open source um, tools that you can use to mine every kind of repository that free software, open source software projects uh, usually use. So of course, you can get information out of Git or Baxilla or Runspad or from mailing list or Gerrit, but you can also go to um, Stack Overflow, for instance, and get information about your project, how, your, how people are talking about your project, or to Slack and, and get uh, conversations from there. Um, then we used Remarlib, which is a library, it's a Python library. Uh, basically produces the information that you want from the database. And um, mostly it produces usually JSON files that are later animated with uh, this Grimoire, which is basically a JavaScript library that we use for producing the dashboards. Uh, we are also in this talk presenting uh, Grimoire and JWAL. Well, Grimoire and JWAL was presented in Oscan. But the Kibana basic proof of concept, that's because we are trying new ways of showing the dashboard that are a bit more actionable, so where you can play more. And Kibana is a good uh, uh, solution for this. Kibana is also open source software, so all of this is, all the cool stack we use is open source software, so you can take it and reproduce it if, if, if you want. And uh, uh, Kibana is showing some capabilities that are very interesting to us, and I hope to you. Okay, so, um, the talk is not going to be about performance or about how Kibana, sorry, how uh, OpenStack has been used or things like that. It's going to be about how it's been developed. So we are going to focus on activity. So basically, how many contributions uh, are there? Uh, processes, how the processes are performing, how the project is performing, and uh, things like how long they are taking to close reviews, for instance. And community, who is contributing? Numbers and actors. As I said, we are not going to analyze uh, functionality, runtime performance, or things like that, or even popularity. So that's out of the scope here. And basically what we need is to produce a, a dashboard for, any, for each of these projects, I mean, for, for the four ones that we are analyzing. So this is the Open Nebula dashboard, and I'm going to use it to very briefly explain to you about uh, what we uh, saw in the dashboard. So basically you have one row per data source. So for instance, this is Git. This is, in this case, this is a tracking system. Uh, well, mailing list and uh, um, um, code review system. Um, and you have the main trends. So basically this is about uh, um, people and this is about activity. So for instance, for Git, this is number of commits and this is number of authors per month in both cases. So for, for this dashboard, the data is per month. On the left, you have some numbers about things like the number of um, um, active um, people in the community and things like that. So uh, for all of them, the information is pretty similar. So some have more data sources than, than others, but basically the, the information is quite similar. So you have the URL for each of the dashboards in, in, in the bottom of the, of the slide, so you can go to the internet and check the real thing. Uh, this is uh, OpenStack. Well, OpenStack is so massive in development, I will be talking about that later, that the, the dashboard is by week instead of that by, by month. So you have to consider that when comparing the numbers. And this is Grimoire NG. So in case you want to look at the same data from other point of view, you can go to this one. So these are a bit actionable. You can basically click on the different areas around here in the charts, in the pies, and so on, and you get the information filtered. So that if you are interested in what happens in a specific sub-project of, uh, of stack, for instance, you can get that information over a specific time period. Um, again, there is one of these for each of the four projects. You can go there and analyze the real thing. Again, you have the URL around here, in the bottom of the, of the slide. But the, the information below is the same, so it's just two, two different ways of looking at it. So um, let's start with the transparency analysis. We did have data for all of them, so this is the first thing that we have to look at. So they are really doing open development. Um, there are some issues with some of them, but there are minor issues. So. First of all, all of them have the Git repositories so that you can obviously get all the Git information. And it's not like damp of code. So some projects are just damping code from time to time there. So this is the real thing. So you can see how the patterns of collaboration between people are, are in the Git repository. So 
we really can understand how they are adding more, more, more and more changes to the repository over time. All the code uh, seems to be in Git at some time, so you can compare it with the distribution. You find everything is in the Git at some point. And uh, for the cases of OpenStack, uh, uh, CloudStack, and, and, and Eucalyptus, it seems that all the tickets are in the ticketing system. It's, that's not that clear for Open Nebula, because of the um, traffic you see there, it's very likely that they have a, a different uh, tracking system for the customers or something like that. And with respect to, uh, well, and that's it. So that's the only minor issue that means that maybe Open Nebula is not showing all the information about tickets. Uh, so let's look at the numbers. So this is activity, and uh, here you start to see the main differences between the projects, and it's very, very obvious. So this is the number of commits, and you can see how PinStack stands out by almost an order of magnitude. Um, if you look at the developers, you basically see the same thing. From like pretty close to 4,000 active developers at some point in OpenStack, the next one is CloudStack with uh, some more than 300. So you, you can see that there is like level of, uh, sorry, an order of magnitude in, in activity and in community between OpenStack and the others. And in between the others, there are also differences. And the most clear difference is this one. So these are code developers. How we de define code developers? Those that wrote more than 85% of the code, right? So that means that in the case of Open Nebula, the team of people really writing the code, I mean, most of the code, are seven people. So it's a small team, a small company. Eucalyptus is a bit more, CloudStack is a bit more, and in OpenStack, you need to uh, amount for the contributions of 337 uh, uh, sorry, 37 people to have 85% of the contributions. So it's clearly, more active community with a bigger core. If you look at the ticketing system, you find similar uh, results. Well, you find the, the only probably outlier is Open Nebula, which is having much less uh, tickets than the others. But then if you compare these, which are sort of in the order of 10,000 with OpenStack, which is in the order of 7,000, you can find that, that, that there is a difference too. I, I'm not sure if there is a question over there. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I don't remember exactly. You, ha you can see that in the dashboards, but it's basically almost all of them that are considered by OpenStack as OpenStack. I mean, doesn't include a st um, um, Yeah. Right. This is July, and this is not. Yeah. That you are right, uh, Stefano. Thanks for the clarification. Um, well, I was with tickers. With tickets, if you look at, at the people submitting tickets, that's very important because that's the, peop that the number of people who bothered to go to the uh, ticketing repository and inform of an error or ask for a feature request or things like that. And again, you can see an order of magnitude of difference uh, between OpenStack and the next one, which is uh, CloudStack. And then these two are even smaller, right? Uh, then we can look specifically at the last month, this was for the whole history. You can, look the, you can look specifically at the last months, and for that, uh, you can see how um, uh, all the numbers, well, numbers are approximate, first of all, but all the numbers are consistent with the other. So this is a more fair comparison because it doesn't have into account the history. So the other one means that if a project get, gets longer, it's going to have more, more commits, for instance, but this is comparing in the same time period. So you can, I'm not going to enter into the details of the numbers, but you can see how they are, again, this order of magnitude of difference is again happening. So let's now go to the most specific, but I hope interesting staff. So first of all, the, the aging charts. For the aging charts, the data is quite, simil, quite, quite simple. It's like looking at the aging structure of a community. So if you look, do that for a country, for instance, you know how many people are old, how many people are young, how many people were born during the last year. So this is exactly the same, considering as age, time in the project. And we talk about time active in the project. So if we are talking about developers, for instance, I, I mean committers, or authors, we are talking about people being active as authors. So if you stay for six months without a commit, for instance, you become dead, let's say, in the project and you disappear from the uh, aging chart. So the idea is with this, you can find out how much uh, old expertise we have. You can look at the old generation, how many of them are we retaining? But you can also see how many new blood we have. 
So how many people are, are being born in the parade? Let's say how many people are coming, are being attracted? So the um, aging um, chart is like this. So it's like half of the population pyramid, which you probably know from demographics. And um, for instance, this is for CloudStack. And uh, you can see this is the last generation. So the people entering during the last six months. So by the way, this is for, uh, I guess it's starting in last uh, um, September. So three months before September. And um, you can see that you have the blue and the, and the yellow lines. Yellow lines are the number of people that entered the project in each generation. So this is the number of people, like 40, that entered during the last six months. The previous six months, they entered that much people, like 80. Of those, still the blue line are in the project, are active, in the sense that they are still committing, right? So that, that means that if you look at the second generation, they had like 80 entering, and they are like uh, 35 retained, the other left, right? Consider that this is quite normal, because if you make a commit, you became a part of the population, but it's very likely that many people just do some commit and then leave, because that was something uh, casual. Depends a lot on the committing policies of the project. In some projects, the barrier for committing is very high. In some others, it's not that high. In this one, it's not that high. So people can enter and leave very quickly. But in any case, you can see that, for instance, here, you basically don't have people with more than four years of experience still in the project. And you can see how the old people, there are very few of them, right? Now you compare with OpenStack. This is OpenStack like one year ago, and this is OpenStack like now, right? And, and you can compare how, like one year ago, the last generation, uh, this is uh, summer uh, 2014 and, and before, six months before, uh, OpenStack attracted like 600 people. The, mo the, the, the six months before, they attracted like 500 people. Look at the yellow lines, and you can see how this was ex expanding more, uh, semester after semester. If you look at the yellow lines here, you see a different story, right? You can see, well, periods are not exactly the same, so that's why this difference here. But basically, you had the, OpenStack had this trend of growing up to the last semester. So during the last semester, is the first semester in the, in the history where you are getting a bit more contributor. Well, you had another one here, but this is because of the way we are calculating months, right? So we can say that the population in OpenStack, with respect to attraction of people, it's starting to become stable. So it seems that OpenStack is attracting like between 600 and 800 people every six months, right? And then you can look at the blue lines and you can learn how many of them are retained. And you can see an interesting thing here, which is if you are retained after the first six months, it's very likely that you stay retained. You see, so basically if you can stay for six months, you are in the place for a while. So that's quite interesting because that basically means that there is some kind of entry barriers at the beginning, so maybe some people commit something, but it's too difficult for them, or they maybe they switch to do some other thing, whatever. But if you stay for six months, you have some commitment with the project, and you stay for a longer time, right? And th that's quite interesting. And you can see how there are people, a few of them, but there are people with like five years of developing experience in OpenStack, in open which given how lively the OpenStack community is, it's astounding, because those guys stay committing in the OpenStack group of stories after five years. Well, geographical origin. So this is a different story. Now in where the developers came from, it's really, really difficult. Because basically we don't have that kind of information. If you are running a web server where all the developers have to go there or something, you can look at IPs and IP targeting and so on. But that's the, really the only uh, way of doing that. But most usually, you don't have that information. And it's very difficult to know from the visits to our website whether the people are really developers or not. So uh, we need another kind of analysis. Of course, you can survive, and you can ask developers to register and say where they come from, wherever. But in the end, you are relying on the answers of people. And well, may, they, maybe, maybe they, they don't want to answer, or maybe they just don't bother, which is what happens in, in most projects. So what we do is just to look at the Git repository. In the Git repository, you have the time zone of every contribution, and we just analyze that. Of course, that's, that's not perfect in the sense that we can only track big geographical areas. But for tonight, if you look at how the, the time zones are over the Earth, you can tell interesting things like people working in the East or in the West Coast in the States, 
or working in most of Latin America, or working in uh, Europe, or Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, you can tell China from India, from Japan and Korea, for instance, because they are in different time zones too, and even uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand. So you can have a lot of information. So this is Open Nebula, and this is basically Europe. So time zones one and two, remember the summer time zones that we have in Europe and in the States, right? So this is reasonable because this company is in Madrid, Spain. That's it. You can look at the Eucalyptus, West Toast. Okay. Open stack, cloud stack is a different story. So what is this? India. So like um, not half, but a sensible part of uh, cloud stack is being developed in India. And then you have uh, Europe, Western Europe, and then you have West Coast, bit of East Coast, and then you have OpenStack. OpenStack is, with difference, uh, much more diverse in geographical terms. And an interesting thing to look at is how this is evolving over time. Because you can look at this four years ago, and you can look at this now. And as you can imagine, the main difference is in Europe and in Asia. At the very beginning, this was a lot like uh, the States, uh, but, for instance, uh, in this period, which is the last year, you can see how there is, in fact, much more development in Europe, including Russia and, uh, I'd say, everything until, until the Urals, than in North America, which is interesting if you look at where the companies are located, or at least the headquarters of the companies are located. And, uh, well, you have the participation in, uh, in, in Asia. You can see how India is not that represented, but you can see how China is, China is time zone 8, and Japan and Korea, and this is basically Australia and New Zealand. Right? And as I said, looking at the uh, evolution of this is quite interesting. This is another thing which is only commit patterns. Only commit patterns say a lot about developers. Because if you're a developer working for a company from, say, 9 to 5, that's your commit time. If you are a volunteer working on Saturdays and Sundays in the night, that's your commute time. So by, just by looking at this, you can learn, for instance, how the people in Open Nebula, which is this one, they are mainly working for a company. You can see this is the, the, the usual pattern. And by the way, do you know what's the, the time for uh, having lunch in Madrid? Exactly. You can compare that with the time for having lunch in the case of Eucalyptus, which is California. There's a difference, right? And you can see how the people in Eucalyptus, some of them tend to work late. That means that either they are volunteers or they are working in a company very flexible because they are not working in office hours. So that's not important by itself, but it's important from the point of view if I make a contribution to them when they are going to answer me. So this is much more continuous than the other, right? And this is uh, CloudStack on the top and open, um, OpenStack on the bottom. You can see that OpenStackers are working even at, say, 4 o'clock in the morning, a sensible part of them. So, which is just interesting. And you can see most of them are having lunch at about 12. So if you need to put a meeting, don't, don't, don't write it at 12 o'clock in the morning. But anyway, you can see how this is much more spirit, which is because of, first of all, the community is more varied in terms of cultural uh, areas. For instance, people have lunch at different times. And they stay longer in the night than they stay early in the morning, depending on many other things. There are volunteers, there are many people for companies, but there are a lot of people in companies working in, with flexible times. So this is quite interesting, again, from the point of view of how I have to collaborate with these uh, guys. Another topic, corporate diversity. Corporate diversity is very important for projects because that means I'm depending on a single company or I'm depending on a bunch of companies. So uh, remember that when you're adopting open source software, in fact, you're adopting a community in some sense. So you are relying on that community. If that community is focused around one company, in the end, what is happening is that you are relying on that company. That may be very good or very bad, depending on the policy of the company. At some point, they may decide to invest a lot and the project is going to grow very quickly. Or at some point, they may want to pull the, and uh, rem uh, um, um, uh, remove all the developers from the project and the project is going to have uh, some trouble. Okay, so l let's look at that. So um, if you look at the companies, this is basically a Nebula. A Nebula is Universidad Complutense and Open Nebula, the company. So this is all the history. And this is reasonable because the project started in the university and then moved to the uh, company. And you can see most of the development is both things. This is Eucalyptus. It's 
again a single a single um, uh, company project. This is been, uh, uh, Cloud Stack. Started like being a single um, uh, company project, but they are getting more contributions. Basically, this area is enlarging year over year. So this is for the again for the last from July um, 2014 to uh, June 2015. And you have OpenStack. OpenStack is a different story again. And you have many different companies. You can see how some of them are very big, but there are a lot, and there are a lot more here in others. So. In the bottom, you have the number of companies active per month with contributions. And you can see how, since more than one year ago, it became a city over 50. So that means that there are over 50 companies contributing every month to OpenStack. So they are so much committed to do that kind of thing. So uh, again, the diversity here is quite different with respect to the uh, other projects. Uh, we felt at some point that we needed a number for talking about diversity. So we came to the basics, and we remember that Apache is doing something like this. So the idea in Apache is, how much do we depend on developers? So how many developers do we um, rely on when we are talking about the project? And the idea was, let's define the pony factor. So the idea is, uh, well, they consider like um, Apache developers with ponies, and how many ponies do we have for amounting like 50% of the contributions to the code? So that's the pony factor. We extended that to companies, and we defined the elephant factor. So companies are not ponies, they are more like elephants, you know? So the idea is how many companies you need to amount for 50% for of the contributions to the code, right? This is a single number. Of course, single numbers, you now have a lot of trouble, but with that number, you can capture um, how you are depending on different companies. and. Uh, this is uh, the table for some projects in the area of cloud. So not only these four, but some others. And you can see how the penny factor, for instance, for Open Nebula is four. There are four people contributing more than 50% of, of the contributions. For Ecolecton is five. For OpenStack is more than 100. But you can go deeper and you, you can find that for Cloud Foundry, it's like a bit more than 40. For OpenShift is like 10. For Docker is like 15. And for Kubernetes is for 12. If you look at the elephant factor, all of them are one except for OpenStack. But OpenStack is big. If you look at OpenStack at the different granularity, looking project by project within OpenStack, the story is a bit different. I'm going to tell you later, right? But right now you can see how there is also a difference here. Well, this is just the number of commits, excluding bots, just to know about what we are talking about. So here we're talking that six companies are doing half of 126 uh, commits which is like a bit more than 60,000 commi 60, commits per, or, or I mean, all the five companies together, which is a sizable amount of commits, by the way, right? So now let's go to the final part of the talk, which is this Kibana-based dashboards. And uh, here I'm going to analyze in a bit more of detail two specific aspects of OpenStack. One of it is the elephant factor, and the other one is uh, code reviews. Uh, for this, it's very important that at some point you go to the dashboard and look at the real thing. So we have, sorry, we have prepared two dashboards for this. The first one is for companies. It's basically commits, and uh, you can drill down by company, by person, by project, and by time, and by, by some other things. And the second one, uh, sorry, the first one is for code reviews, where basically you can learn about how long code reviews are, and uh, what happens in terms of uh, time to merge in code reviews. Uh, by the way, both dashboards are not a product. Uh, they are still a proof of concept, but the data is real. And uh, I guess that they work pretty well. So at least to, to have an idea of what, what's happening. So um, this is the one on contributions. I'm going to, to talk later. And this is the one about um, code reviews. So let's uh, start with contributions. So uh, the elephant factor. I said that for OpenStack, the elephant factor is six. But what happens if we go project after project? So let's start with Nova. Nova is the, the largest one in, in terms of number of, of contributions. And we can see how the elephant factors here, this is the share by companies. Well, it's a bit more than two. Could be two, three, depending on how you count it. So that's quite important, because if you think of, of, of OpenStack as a whole project, so that's nice. We have and a factor of six, you are relying on a lot of companies, that, that's okay. But if you go component after component, 
you can see that for some of the components, the diversity is not that high. So for instance, you can see basically two companies are doing, or, or at least in the past did, most of Nova. By the way, uh, this is uh, Rackspace, this is IBM, right? Uh, of course, time passes by, and uh, it's not the same Nova for all the history of Nova, the Nova for the last year. And probably the story for the last year is more interesting because I really don't that doesn't that it, it really doesn't matter a lot who was working in Nova three years ago. It's it's important who, work, who was working in Nova right now. And here again, you can see that the uh, the factory is a bit bigger. So you have like three companies, and the companies are different. The first one is um, I'm sorry, but uh, it's IBM. The second one, the second one is uh, Red Hat. The third one is NEC. And uh, this tells uh, an interesting story because you can see how companies are changing over time. So racket space is no longer between the, the top three or the top four even uh, uh, companies there. And you can find down in the list and they are pretty low compared to where they were like uh, uh, three years ago. Which means that companies are uh, you know, switching in activity and the breed is still being active. In this uh, uh, chart, I'm not going to enter into details, but basically you can see the same thing over time. And uh, well, basically you can see uh, the activity during the last two years, uh, I guess basically, uh, no, sorry, the last year of all of this, and this is Red Hat, for instance, and you can see how the contribution of Red Hat is changing over time compared to the other companies. From that, you can also infer trends. You can see whether a company is rising or not in the contributions to the, to the project. Uh, just to compare, this is Neutron. Neutron is by number of commits the second most active project in OpenStack. And you can see how for Neutron, the diversity is a bit higher. So you can count for companies five, it's around that, okay? And you can see again that the companies are different. The first one is the same, then you have HP, then you have Mirandis, uh, and, the, and the other one is, sorry, uh, Bitrix, right? Um, you can again look at this in more detail and again go to the dashboard and drill down. You can click on everything and learn about for instance, the specific story of a certain company in the period. But the, the, the interesting thing here is this period is a bit more diverse than Nova. And you can go to HIT. And HIT, it's like two companies. But you can see not only that it's like two companies, it's like four companies for 75% of the code. So it's like five companies in total is 85% of the code. So it's, it's diverse, but it's not as diverse as the others. And you can also look at the trends, and you can see that the trends are interesting by themselves too. And you can think about how this project is going to be next year in terms of diversity if the current trends don't change. Of course, a company can change this at any moment because they can basically push more resources to the project. But that doesn't happen from one day to the other because in OpenStack, all of these are approved commits. So some other reviewers were looking at the commit. So it's not a matter of, I put more committers, I start to contribute more. It's a bit more complex than that. So the trends here are really interesting. And just to compare Cinder, Cinder is one of the most diverse projects right now in OpenStack. And you can see have, they have a factor of around six, seven. And you can see how there are a lot of companies in the, in the long tail and you can see how the evolution is also, let's say, very healthy. Companies are entering and leaving, but the project seems to be uh, working pretty well. By the way, remember that this is companies, not people. In some cases, change just because people move from one company to another, but the people is the same. So if you look at the same thing for people, it's, in many cases, it's surprising how different it is, because some of the projects have a stable team of people, but the team of people came from company to company over time. And now let's move to the last thing I'm going to tell you about, which is trying to understand the review process in OpenStack. Again, please go to the dashboard. I only have five minutes to try to show you this. And this is a bit complex, but quite interesting from my point of view. Remember that code review is very important because for all the companies doing a continuous uh, deployment, basically code review is in the middle to continuous deployment. I mean, every time you have something to do, to propose, his, propose it uh, as, a, as a feature request or as a bug report. At some point, that gets implemented. And when it gets implemented, it's submitted to the uh, code review process. So there starts to count the timer because the company or the person is usually very interested in having that patch for putting that into the real thing to deploy. 
to deploy it. Uh, so the shorter the code review process, the better. And in addition, we have also a measure of effort, which is if you have to submit a lot of versions for the same, um, for the same paths, that's interesting because the paths probably is, is, is um, becoming better and better, but in the end, it's a lot of effort, both by the developer who has to produce new, ver new versions of the paths and for the reviewers who have to review a lot of new versions of the paths too. So the ideal thing would be that all the patches are as good that I can just approve them and go directly to the code base. That would be nice, but obviously it doesn't happen, and that's why we have code review. But in the end, the closer to one, the better. If it is growing, that means that there is a lot of effort in making that patch better. Effort by the developer and effort by the uh, code reviewers. So this is the first uh, um, stand, which is this is for all the history of OpenStack. And this is basically, um, um, sorry, um, I don't have my glasses now, but uh, this is new. New uh, means still in process. So these are active reviews. So uh, this is merge, so reviews that ended in the code base, and this is abandoned. This is the first interesting result that 20% of all the reviews get abandoned. So in some sense, that's wasted effort. Of course, not, not always. Many of them are abandoned, and then there's a new, a new one which is based on it and so on. But basically, some people invested a lot of effort in this area here, and that code didn't, is not going to, to, to be merged ever. This is the evolution of a time of all of these parameters. Um, this is time open. And uh, this is a number of patch sets. The top, uh, the top row is number of patch sets, and the bottom is time open. Time open is in days. So first, very interesting results. Uh, median, I mean 50% of the contributions, is one day or less. I, we are rounding uh, here to the floor, so that means that, in fact, it can be up to two days. Right? But that's very interesting because that means that half of the contributions to OpenStack get landed into code or get abandoned in two days, which is pretty good for most standards in many projects. Well, you can see how this grows higher if you go to the 75%, to the 95%, or to the 99%. So there are some patches that take like 200 days or more, but those are 1% of the patches. I mean, one percent of the proposed changes, and this is the number of uh, of uh, of, um, of iterations, so the, the number of patch sets that you have to submit. So again, half of them, half of all the reviews, needed only two patches, which is pretty good because that means that those half of the uh, code reviews, you only the reviewers only had to review twice, and the second one was the good one. So that, that that's that's nice. Again, if you look at the seventy-five percent, you have four. If you look at the um, 95% uh, is 12, and you have 1% which are more than 25 uh, versions or patches, which is, well, interesting. You can look at the uh, history of a time, and this trend is, doesn't mean that the project is getting better and better, it's just that the uh, reviewers didn't have time to get longer, okay? And uh, something important, this is the numbers for 99%, 95%. And 50% is so low that it's beyond here. So here we're basically looking at the outliers, right? And the same here. This is basically the outliers, more than 95%. And the real thing, most of the interesting thing happens here, which is pretty low. We can do the same for specifically abandoned uh, 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 reviews. I'm not going to enter into all the details because I'm, I'm, I'm running short of time. But basically, you can run the same. And for instance, for abandoned reviews, an interesting thing is that in some cases, they got abandoned after 22 iterations. So it would be nice if both um, developer and um, Samir and reviewers noticed before that that this should be uh, um, killed because it's not going to be anywhere. Um, with time, in some cases, this is 280 days. And while well, you can do the same analysis for those merge, and here you can see that some are merged after 25 iterations. So if your review is getting like 20 iterations, you still have some chances of being approved and, and, and being entered. And you can look at the, at the, at the days, and um, for 99, I believe for 1% of the contributions, it took more than 43 days to merge the contribution. Well, then you can look at the, at the backlog. So this is the current backlog as of yesterday or something. And you can see how old the reviews are. So this is per month. 
So this, more, all of these reviews has one, of, um, um, one month or less. These are the next one, two months, three months, and this is the whole history. So you have uh, some reviews that are like uh, 15 months old and are still being considered. So I mean, the, the, the code review didn't end for them. And you can look again at the times while well, I'm not going to, to enter into the details. This is specific for NOVA because all of the projects have very specific numbers. And yes, we are going to focus on this one. So this is the number of days. NOVA is a bit higher than the, than the mean. Remember that it was one, which means basically two or less. And here it is three, which means four or less. So it's a bit more than the rest of the project. And you can look at Neutron. Neutron is very well. It's, it's like two or less days. And you can, you can look at it. It's like three, for instance. You can look at all the numbers, by the way, but I'm just focusing on this one. And, um, and well, you can also, um, in, in the rest of the, of the, of the charts, you can think, see things like how many of them are abandoned. So for instance, HIT is very good at having quick reviews, but a lot of them are abandoned, which is not necessarily good. You can compare that with NOVA, for instance, which is pretty similar, but this one is a bit less than that, okay? This is for the last year, by the way. And uh, then you have um, part of this information in the reports that we prepare for the OpenStack Foundation. If you want to look at there, it's more uh, a summary of what's happening, but if you have less time, maybe it's just a matter of reading that. And um, this is the end, so I'm going to finish. I'm out of time, so final considerations. So there are huge differences between the different projects. That doesn't mean that some of them are better than the others, depending on what you need. And we are only talking about how the development process is working. We are saying nothing about the quality of the result, for instance. But in many cases, now in our community, on who, on who I rely, now in our the project. So for instance, I can see here that if I have a patch for OpenStack and the patch is good, it's very likely like in two days, it's going to enter the code base. So if I'm doing continuous integration, that's a pretty good number to know. Uh, picture for a moment that that's an important security fix. So that's the numbers that we, that we have here. Um, in the end, look at the details. It's very important. And you can use the dashboards to drill down to the level that you may uh, need. And uh, for the specific case of OpenStack, OpenStack is large, but large and complex. And there is no such thing as the OpenStack development. Well, you have a lot of things in common, but you also have differences. So some of the projects are reviewing in twice the time than others, for instance. So there is also a lot of uh, opportunities for learning for good practices. Some of, some of the OpenStack projects are doing it better from some point of view than others. And you can drill down, look at the numbers, and say, what are doing these guys for being so good in this parameter? And I can try to learn from them. Of course, every project is different. It's different, sorry, it has different peculiarities. But um, they are sort of homogeneous too. So you can learn a lot from a similar project and, and try to understand what's happening and try to uh, basically extend the good practices to the rest of the, of the project. And uh, well, a short sort of disclaimer, and that's all. You have the links for all the things, and that's it. Since we are short of time, but we are the last talk, if you want, we can go out and, and talk if, if you have questions. Thank you very much.